My name is Greg Quick. Uh, I'm an astronomer. Well, actually, I'm probably just a bloke from the bush who's learned a few things about stars. And I live in Broome, which is on the Pearl Coast in the wild Kimberley region of Western Australia. My lifelong journey with the stars has taken me from being a pearl diver to a bush mechanic, to an astronomy guide, to sharing the stage with one of the world's most famous physicists. Over the next hour, I'm going to share some of what I've learnt so far, from how to actually see the Earth rotating, to navigating by the stars, and understanding the cycles of the moon. I'll share it in eight simple lessons. You can think of them as chapters in my guidebook to the night sky. I'll also tell you a bit about my life. Everything I show you, you're going to be able to do for yourself. Stargazing changed my life, and I want to show you how it can do the same for you. One of the first memories I have of the night sky came from going marin fishing with my dad. These days, I live in the Kimberley, but I grew up in the southwest of Western Australia. I was eight years old, and dad and I would go out at night along the Warren River. And it was just the sheer spectacle of it sitting on that river and looking out into the night sky. It fascinated me, and that fascination never left. A few years after high school, I set out to travel around Australia. And in 1982, I arrived in Broome. So when I first came into Broome, I didn't really know what I was going to do. I was a bit lost, actually. 20 years old, wandering around Australia, going, where am I going? What am I doing? Anyway, I got to Broome and I just happened to find myself walking down the street in Dampier Terrace, which is where all the pearl sheds were and the pearl shops still are. And I'd been diving since I was 14, so walked in and said, do you guys need any divers? And they said, yes, start tomorrow. So I got a job pearl diving. A big reason for Broome's existence is the Pink Tata Maxima pearl shell. When people first came here, they were all over the ground. I mean, you could walk out on these mud flats and find these pearl shell. So people fished them and they collected all, they called it dry shelling. So when the tide went out, they'd go out and collect all the dry shell. Now, pretty soon they fished all of the dry shell out. So then they had to go deeper. And so they started diving. But it didn't take too long before they fished out that shallow shell as well. And so then they had to go to the hard hat dive system. And uh, they went really deep with that stuff. And you know, the, the divers of Broome are legendary all the way around the world. Working as a diver means working with the cycle of the tides. And the tides, of course, are governed by the moon. In fact, Broome's got the second biggest tides in the Southern Hemisphere. And we used to park our boats here every morning, or actually every night, and we'd come back the next morning. And if those boats were floating, we'd got the, got the boats in the right place. If you got it wrong, you would have to drag that heavy boat across a wet mud flat. And if you got it wrong the other way, you'd have to swim out to that boat on a cold July morning. And it was a really good idea to learn the tides and to end up with your boat parked in. About that much water was perfect. Yeah. Having to understand the moon helped turn me into an astronomer. And it's something you can learn for yourself.
So a lot of people ask me how the phases of the moon work. And to help answer that question, I've got a trusty number 11 boy that I found in my backyard. And it looks a bit beaten and crashed into, and I think it's going to make a great moon for us tonight. So, this is the sun. This is the moon. You are the Earth, looking out from Earth at the sun and the moon. Now, as the moon goes around the Earth, we're going to simulate that here tonight by me going around the moon with the sun. So, if we come all the way around to here, we have an alignment between the sun, the moon and the Earth. So the moon is closer to the Earth than the sun. And with this alignment, you can't see the moon. It's not lit up. So that's our biggest tides, which we call springs. So the spring tides happen when there's an alignment between the Earth, the sun and the moon. And that happens twice in a month, once at new moon, and the other time is full moon when the moon is opposite the sun and we're in the middle. With those two times of alignment, there's a combined gravitational pull from the sun and the moon which magnifies the tide. As the sun comes around this way a little, again simulating the moon going around the earth, we can begin to see a bit of a crescent phase of the moon here. And as we keep on coming around even further, we get to this stage and from Earth you can see half a moon lit up. Either side of half moon are what we call neap tides, when the water doesn't come in as far or go out as far. Working in the pearling industry, instead of working during the week and having the weekends off, you'd work the neap tides and have the spring tides off because the currents are too big and the silt is all stirred up. And, you know, you just get dragged along the bottom and you'd have to hang on to things everywhere and it was just, you know, impossible to dive. If we keep on coming around like this, more of the moon's lit, more of the moon's lit, until we reach a point where that sunlight is shining on the full face of the moon and from Earth, that's what you get. And we have that alignment between the sun behind you yourself watching from Earth and looking at that sunlight lighting up this full face. So that's the journey of the moon going around the Earth, which takes it 29 and a half days to go from one full moon to the next. Yeah, well, certainly being a pearl diver, is, it was my first astronomical step. And tuning into that relationship between the Earth, the Sun and the Moon, and it really is a dance between those three objects. Got me started on the path that I'm still on. I'm still got a long way to travel down this path of my own. And the Moon helped to bring that to me in the first place. And I'm going to suggest that it can for you too. Well, working as a pearl diver, it was a pretty rough and ready industry. I got enough bends in my time as a diver to eventually go, that's enough, I'm out of here. So after about a year on the job, I answered an ad for a mechanic or an experienced person, and I thought, there's my opening. And that kind of morphed into a career living and working on remote cattle stations, fixing bulldozers and playing around with graders and road trains and, and anything else that needed fixing. Working out in the bush means sleeping in a swag, on the ground, underneath a sky like this. And I reckon it took me about a hundred times before I looked up there one morning and I had a look around and I went, hang on. Everything's shifted. There's something going on here. So here we are under a magnificent Kimberley sky, and there's some pretty special stuff going on at the moment too. We've got a star out here at the moment called Rigel, which is just popping over that eastern horizon, and it's a part of a constellation called Orion. And we can see just in here. And it's pretty useful for us at the moment because it's kind of almost on the horizon. It's almost in those trees. And 
I can remember the first time I had a realisation of something very special that's going on here at the moment. And it's going to take me a little while to help you have the same experience. So I'm going to wander off and have a sleep and I'll talk to you about it again a little bit later. There's nothing like a bit of a, a sleep under the stars to really energise you. And let's have a look and see what's happened. So we can see where Orion is now. And when we first started watching it, before I went and had a sleep, it was down here somewhere. So in the time that I've been away having a bit of a snooze, the Earth has rolled a long way. And all of the stars we can see in the sky are indeed fixed in the sky. We call them fixed stars. So all of the movement we're seeing tonight is simply due to the Earth turning us this way. And it's a simple matter of going out yourself, finding yourself a nice spot under the stars, checking, you know, picking something in that eastern sky as we've done there tonight, and having Orion makes it really easy. It's recognisable. And then wander off, ignore it for a while, come back a couple of hours later, or, you know, even 20 minutes later, half an hour later, and you will easily see this movement of the Earth rolling us in this direction, bringing all of these stars across the sky. And that was the moment that it became real for me. In that moment, I knew that I was on a planet that was turning in space. And sure, I know everybody out there knows the Earth's turning and they know the Earth's round, and, and I knew that too. But having that realisation of it, turning that intellectual knowledge into experience is something just completely different again. Very powerful moment in my life. With the Earth turning in this direction here, that means that anything on this eastern, in this eastern sky will appear to rise into the sky. So the stars, the planets, the moon will all appear to rise over here. In the west, of course, as we're turning away from that part of the sky, anything in that western sky will appear to go down. So stars, moon, planets again. So that means that if I turn around and face south, Anything in this southern sky will appear to do circles like so. So we can choose the Southern Cross. And it's made up of Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, and the little one in there is called Epsilon. So what's going to happen with that Southern Cross tonight is it will appear to climb up into the sky, up and around like this. Tuning into the Earth turning, I mean, it, it spurred a lot of different thoughts in me. For instance, I was going for a walk one day, and I was thinking, if, if I'm walking towards the direction of the sunset, I'm walking into the future. And if I turn around and walk away from the sunset, I'm walking into the past. And if I walked all the way around the Earth, did one lap of the Earth, I would be a day in the future or a day in the past. And these were the thoughts that came to me. And at the same time, this, you know, those thoughts expanded to go, well, if you had a really fast motorbike, and I mean a really, really fast motorbike, perhaps you could have a go at going as fast as the Earth is turning. But that speed in the tropics is about 1,600 kilometres an hour. So you know, I haven't got any motorbikes that go that fast. Now that you've seen the Earth turn for yourself, you know, you've seen the stars rise in the eastern sky, and turn around in the southern sky. What I'd like to encourage you to do next is go out again tomorrow night and set yourselves up to do the same thing. And you will easily convince yourselves again that the Earth is turning. And you'll begin to have it to the point where you'll be able to share it with other people too and have them experience the same thing. 
So get out there, have a look, put it into your life. I spent the rest of the 80s working all around the Kimberley. By day, I was a mechanic, but at night, I was spending more and more of my time stargazing. Seeing the Earth turn had been a pivotal moment, but it took another four or five years for me to notice something even more grand was happening in the night sky. And what I'd picked up was the journey of the Earth going around the Sun. about four or five years to really notice this journey because I had to watch this cycle happen four or five times. We're on a planet that is turning, that is also hurtling through space on a journey going around the sun. So look at this amazing model of the Earth. It's round, it spins, and it goes around the sun. And we've got the sun over there too, the source of everything that we are. We're in Broome, which is just here on the wild Kimberley region of Western Australia. And the Earth is turning around this way. And from this viewpoint, the sun is just rising above the horizon. That's called sunrise. And then what happens as the Earth keeps on turning, we're going to reach a point where from Broome, the sun will appear to disappear into the Indian Ocean, and for us, it will be gone. And then we get to look out here with no sun in the sky at all from our viewpoint, and the sky fills with stars. The Earth moves around the sun, in 365 days, and there are 360 degrees in a circle. So that means the Earth moves about one degree around the sun every day. So at this time tomorrow night, the Earth is going to have moved by one degree, which means that the stars in the sky will have appeared to move across the sky by one degree, if you're watching at that same time of night. As the Earth turns, it will turn 30 times while it goes that far around the sun. Now, that's a month, so it's moved 30 degrees around the sun. And in that time, we get to see a different part of the sky facing away from the sun. And 30 days later, 30 spins later, we move to the next stump. And 30 spins later, we move to the next stump. And again, we've got a completely different piece of sky in relation to our position with the sun. And as the Earth keeps on spinning and keeps on spinning, six months after we started, this is where we are. Nine months after we started, we get to here. And in 12 months, we come all the way back to where we started. And on this journey, as we've gone all the way around the sun, on each of those stations, on each of those months, we've had access to a different part of the sky. And watching that, if you're watching at the same time each night, you'll see that constellation, that constellation, that constellation. And this changing of the sky shows us the journey of the Earth going around the sun. So watching this journey of ours is something that we can do incrementally, you know, day by day if you're really good at it, week by week, quite easily, month by month, for sure. But if you really want to watch the big movements, have a look at where we are in six months' time and have a realisation that we're actually going to be on the other side of the sun, which makes us about 300 million kilometres away from where we are now. Although, you know, we've had to do a, a, a circular path to get there and we'll have travelled more like 471 million kilometres. You know, we're travelling. We're doing something like 67,000 miles an hour, which is 
you know, something like 110,000 kilometres an hour on this journey. It's, we're motoring. And you can see this happening in the sky. We've got Orion out here tonight. And if we were out here in a week's time at the same time, Orion would be seven degrees higher in the sky. If we came back in a month and watched at the same time, Orion's going to be 30 degrees across the sky. 30 days, 30 degrees. In two months, it's going to be up there. In three months, it's going to be 90 degrees away from where it is now. And that's because the Earth goes a quarter of the way around the sun in three months. In six months, we go halfway around the sun. So in six months, Orion is going to be as far below this horizon as it is above that one now. In fact, everything that's above the horizon now will be below the horizon in six months' time. And there'll be a completely different set of stars in the sky. And it doesn't matter where you are on Earth tonight, the stars that are in the sky are the same stars that everybody on Earth is seeing. We are all in the same position on that journey going around the sun. So we all have access to the same part of the sky on the same day. The only difference in our viewpoint is if you are south of the equator or if you're north of the equator, the stars will appear to be shifted south or north. So keep that in mind as we go through the night. I still remember the first time I looked through a telescope. It was around 1987, and I was still working as a mechanic. I decided that I wanted to see Saturn, but I needed something stronger than binoculars. So I knew it was time for me to go and find a telescope. It took me a long time to track down somebody with a telescope, and they didn't really know what they were doing with it either. In fact, it was all kind of pulled apart in a box under somebody's bed and we dragged it out and I figured out how to make it work and lined it up on Saturn and oh, it was just right, here it is, it's real, we can see it. So to see Saturn that first night in, in what was a four and a half inch telescope made me go, if that's what I can see in a four and a half inch telescope, I'm gonna get a 10 inch telescope. Three years later, I bought one and I've been collecting them ever since. So planetary astronomy is just something that is accessible to anyone. Even in the city, you can pick up these details. So, you know, people say, ah, oh, it's no good having a telescope in the city, but for the planets, it is. Finding the planets in the first place is an exercise in understanding the plane of the solar system, which is called the ecliptic. All of the planets, the only place you'll ever find the planets is on the ecliptic. Also the sun and the moon. So if the sun's already below the horizon, you go, well, that's where the sun disappeared over that horizon. Draw that line from the moon across to the sun. And if there's any bright objects on that line, there's a good chance that they will be planets. We're out here tonight with Saturn. It's looking beautifully clear in the sky. And I've got one of my favourite eight-inch telescopes set up on it. Great little device. What's happening here is the very light of Saturn is coming into the front of this telescope, which then throws that light down into this beautiful little camera, takes it down this cord, and here we have it on the monitor. In a telescope, the main features that show up on the rings of Saturn are the gap in the rings, which we call a Cassini division. But when we think about those rings, they're about 250,000 kilometres across, and yet they're only about 10 metres thick. So these rings, are, they're razor thin. In this digital image, we are, you know, we've, we've got a good picture there. It's, it gives us the idea of what Saturn is. 
We can see the ball in the middle. We can see the rings. But if we could look at this directly in the eyepiece coming out of the telescope, it's even sharper. I mean, our eyes seem to work a lot better with that direct light. And you would see those splits in the rings. You would see the, the markings on Saturn itself. And not only that, but that, that very light of Saturn hits you in the eye. And there's something else that's amazing about Saturn's light. Being up to 1,700 million kilometres away from Earth, Saturn's light travels through space for over an hour to reach us. Vast distances like this can be hard to even imagine. But they're key to understanding the size of our solar system. In the books, they lay out scale models for us and they draw pictures of the planets and they put them in a formation to show you their order. But if we were to have that scale correct in the book to the distances shown in the book, those planets would all be smaller than a speck of dust on that page. To really understand the makeup of our solar system, I came up with my own scale model. And I can show you how it works. What I've chosen to do today is to use a coconut for the sun. And the sun's actually 109 times bigger than the Earth. So we can imagine the Earth would fit 109 times across this coconut. So we're going to use that for the sun. What I've got here is a bowl of planets. And then we're going to go one, two, three, and a half metres. And we come to this very tiny planet, Mercury, a third of the size of the Earth. And then we're going to go five metres further out again. And now we're going to come to Venus. Now, Venus is pretty much exactly the same size as the Earth. And then we're going to go five metres further away again, and we come to Earth. Now, I mentioned Earth's about exactly the same size as Venus. How did I go? That grain of sand? It's close enough. So here we go. There is the Earth. And then we're going to go five metres further out again, and we come to Mars. It's about half the size of the Earth, so I think I've got the right size grain of sand here. So I guess what we're getting out of this too is that there is a lot of space here with not many things in it. So far, we've got four grains of sand between us and that coconut over there. So we've got a lot of area with not very much in it at all. We've just laid out all of these grains of sand as the inner or rocky planets. Then I've got a bowl full of gas giant planets here. This biggest planet, Jupiter, 11 times bigger than the Earth, 60 metres further that way in this model of ours, or 750 million kilometres in real terms. Saturn's the next one, 9 millimetres in diameter, twice as far as Jupiter at 114 metres, and more like 1,500 million kilometres away. And then Uranus in our model's about 250 metres away. Neptune's about 350 metres away. And if we include Pluto in this picture, about 450 or nearly half a kilometre away from where we are now. Recognising the size of the solar system and helping others discover the planets as I did is an experience I've shared thousands of times since. Seeing people's first response when they see Saturn through a telescope is just, you know, I'm sure it's the reason that many astronomers do what they do. And it reminds me, every time I see somebody do that, of the first time I saw Saturn and the amazement that I had. It's just so incredibly perfect that it's very difficult to believe what you're seeing is real. And yet, it's there. It's in the telescope. For the next five or six years, I kept collecting telescopes while I grew and learned as an astronomer. Gradually, I began to look at stargazing just as I looked at the other great passion in my life, motorbikes. I love bikes. They're how I left home and how I was able to explore Australia. To me, a bike means freedom, a way to literally get lost. 
Getting lost is probably one of my favourite things to do in the world. And I guess that's because I don't really mind. Because you put me out under the stars and I'll soon figure out where I am. Navigation is something that uh, has a special appeal to everybody. You mention it and they all want to know, how am I going to find south? And that's what I really like to do, is put that in your hands so you can kind of see where you're going. I just want to set you up so you know where we are at the moment too. This is west out here. That's east over here. Behind me is south. Behind you is north. And the Earth at the moment is turning all of us this way. So if we look into this eastern sky, things will appear to climb into the sky. Same in the west. We're turning away from that part of the sky, so things out here will appear to drop down in the sky. So that means that if I turn around and face south, the Earth is going to turn me this way, which means any stars in this southern sky will appear to do circles that way. Here in Broome, we are 18 degrees below the equator. In other words, we're 18 degrees around the curve of the Earth towards the South Pole. And what that does for us here tonight, it puts a very special point of rotation 18 degrees above this southern horizon. So this point of rotation is called the South Celestial Pole. And the word celestial simply means in the sky. So this is the South Pole in the sky, which is also a point directly above the South Pole on the Earth. So if you went to the South Pole, that point would be directly overhead. But because of our location here, this point of rotation is above the horizon here. It's also a point that's fixed amongst those stars, which makes it possible for us to form a relationship between that point and any of those stars out there that we choose. So we can choose the Southern Cross. It's just a beautiful constellation made up of five distinct stars. There are two stars associated with it, which we call the pointers, because they point at the Southern Cross. And it just so happens that we can draw a line through the long axis of the Southern Cross, and it passes through that point. Now, that's pretty handy. And it also just so happens that we can draw another line that splits these two pointer stars through the middle and it passes through that point too. So what we do is we draw both of those lines together and where those two lines intersect, that is the South Celestial Pole. And having found that very special point of rotation in the sky, it's then a simple matter of dropping this point to the ground, and that is south. So there's your navigation. People say to me, you know, oh, weren't the navigators just amazing how they did all this? Actually, yes, but you know, it's a thing that you can achieve in your own life. Knowing where south is, is the key to knowing where the other directions are too. In your lifetime, every star you can see in the sky is still gonna be there. So they're incredibly predictable, stable, reliable, even more so than my old Harley. Learning about the stars in my own life was something pretty powerful. And I guess, occasionally, I would talk to somebody about what I had learned. And gradually, more and more people began asking me all sorts of questions about what they were seeing in the stars. Until one day, I had the idea to start a business, running my own guided tours of the night sky. That was around 1995, and I've been a full-time stargazer ever since. 
One of the key techniques for looking at the sky and in a telescope is to activate your peripheral vision. Because your direct vision, when you look straight at something, is nowhere near as sensitive as your side vision. So to activate your side vision, you simply move your eyes across the view. Sharing my love of the stars changed my life forever. And even after 30 years, I'm still answering new questions every day. Because of the star tours, I'm the guy that everyone in Broome calls when they see something strange in the sky. A fairly common call that I get is from somebody who's seen a flashing light and they'll call me up and my first question often is, well, what time did you see it? And more often than not, they say, oh, just after seven o'clock or something like that. Hmm, sounds like a weather balloon to me. And they go, no, 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 it can't be a weather balloon because it went up and it shifted direction and it shifted direction and the light flashed and went, yes, sounds like a weather balloon. They release these things regularly and they have a light hanging underneath them. As they head up into the sky, they're measuring wind speed, they're measuring wind direction. And that changes with layers as you go up into the atmosphere. So these balloons go this way and then they go up and then they go that way and they go up and they go up and, and they, they zigzag and dance all the way across the sky. Not only that, the light that hangs under them swings. So that light flashes as well. It gets a lot of people. I take that phone call fairly often. So there are lots of other moving objects in the sky. There are the blinking lights going across the sky quite steadily. They're the aeroplanes. And the steadily moving ones are the satellites. And you can see them with the naked eye. And there is something like 3,000 of those up there at the moment, the last time I checked. One of the particularly bright satellites is the ISS the International Space Station, and it's in orbit at the moment. There's people on it. The International Space Station is due to come across the sky here in a few minutes' time. It's also due to come across the sky and wink out as it gets halfway across. And we're going to show you why. So let's imagine that this is us on the Earth, here, and we're looking out from Earth into space, that way. A satellite comes around the Earth, and the sun is shining on it, and from here, we can look out and see that satellite in the light. As we keep on coming around, that satellite winks out. And from our viewpoint here on Earth, we can't see it anymore. It's going to keep on passing over our head like this, and then it continues on its way, and it disappears over our horizon, and we can't see it from our position here anymore. Now, what I've also done there, I've greatly exaggerated the height of these satellites from the Earth. On this scale, if this is our Earth, these satellites would be about 10 millimetres above the surface here. In fact, if this number 11 boy was painted, the Earth's atmosphere is about as thick as the paint on this ball. We figured out that the International Space Station is about to come over this horizon, so we're just watching out here at the moment and it's pretty much due south tonight. So any minute now, we should spot it. If you decided you wanted to see the ISS, the best thing to do would be to look it up. And any number of websites will give you its location at any time. And it's something that you can see without a telescope. It's amazing. And there it is. There it is. It's just come over the horizon. This thing's bright because the sun's shining on it and it's as big as a football field. It's got solar panels all over it, 
and that's why it reflects so much light. And you can see it moving very steadily across the sky there. It's as bright as any of the other stars in the sky, in fact, brighter. And what's going to happen as it comes across the sky here, eventually it will drop into the Earth's shadow and we won't see it. And I reckon it's fading. It's starting to fade. Look at that, it's gone out. So it dropped into the Earth's shadow and it's still there, but there's no sunlight shining on it now, so we can't see it. So having spent most of my life in a swag underneath a magnificent sky like this, you could say that I've had a lot of wishes come true. And I guess what I'm talking about there is I've seen lots of shooting stars or falling stars, more correctly called meteors. What these meteors are, they're little pieces of rock entering the Earth's atmosphere, going so fast that they burn up as they come through the atmosphere. In fact, they can do between 11 and 72 kilometres per second. To compare that, a bullet out of a gun does one kilometre per second. But at different times of the year, we will see different meteor showers. And meteor showers happen all throughout the year. There are lots of them. You can get a whole list of them. But you can go out almost any night and see meteors. Some of them belong to these showers. Others are what we call random meteors. Then you can spend the rest of the night making wishes. Since I became a full-time astronomer, I reckon I've shared my love of stargazing with over 100,000 people. Broome has been my home for even longer than that, and I love sharing it with my partner, Sobrani. I organise my work around Broome's tropical climate, and over the last three and a half decades, the seasons have come to play an important role in my life. The dry season, which we're coming just towards the end of now, is our growing season here. Uh, once the wet hits, it's, it is a bit too hot for most veggies. But, um, you know, the Aboriginal people here talk about six seasons. They talk about a season coming into the wet season, the wet season itself, the season after that, and then the one leading into the dry. And there's all sorts of signs for these things, you know, just watching what's going on on the ground with the plants and the, the animals. And, you know, these are all indicators that you can see not only on the earth, but also in the sky. Each year, we have four fairly classic seasons if you live in the temperate regions of the world. And we have more like two seasons if you live in the tropics, as we do here in Broome. And these seasons are a product of a particular fundamental orientation of the Earth in space. And I want to show you how it works and how it affects the lives of every one of us. So this is the Earth. It's round, it spins, and it goes around the sun. And as it does these actions, it's also tipped over at 23 and a half degrees. And what that does for us, it brings into play this white circle that runs around our Earth, which is actually the plane of the solar system and we call it the ecliptic. Now, we can project this ecliptic far and wide into our solar system, and all of the planets travel in that plane and in that direction around the sun. Now, at the moment, this position of the Earth in relation to the sun is called solstice. And that means that this tip is lined up, the tipped overness of the Earth is lined up with the sun. That means the southern hemisphere is copping most of the heat, and the northern hemisphere is getting just a glancing blow. So what that means is we're coming into summer in the southern hemisphere. In 
three months' time as the Earth travels and comes to here and spins 90 times while it does that, what we're seeing now is the ecliptic and the celestial equator here cross each other at this point. And the sun is directly over the top of this point. So that's what we call the equinox. So that means the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere are receiving the sun equally. Three months later, we're going to keep on coming around to here. And now we have the other solstice where the sunlight comes and hits the northern hemisphere. And northern hemisphere experiences summer. And the southern hemisphere, there's a glancing blow again of the sun and it's winter time. Three months later, the Earth's going to continue spinning. And once again, we have the ecliptic crossing the equator to give us equinox and both hemispheres receiving the same amount of energy. And then three months later, the Earth turns 90 times. While we come around to there, same tilt. Now the southern hemisphere is copying all of the energy. Northern hemisphere is cold. So this tilt of the Earth going around the sun is what gives us the seasons. We can see it in the ground. We can see it in the trees. We can see it in the animals. We can see it in the sky. And you can track these things with the stars. Having Orion in the sky tells us something about where we are on our own journey going around the sun. When we're on this side of the sun, we see a particular set of stars. We look out away from the sun and Orion dominates that piece of sky during the Southern Hemisphere's summer or the Northern Hemisphere's winter. A lot of people come to Broome in winter when they say to me, where's Orion? Why can't we see Orion in Broome? That lets me know that the only time they ever go stargazing is in the summer because Orion dominates the summer sky. In fact, nobody on Earth can see Orion in the sky during the Southern Hemisphere's winter or the Northern Hemisphere's summer. And this is because the Earth is on the other side of the sun. So let's just imagine for a moment that the Earth wasn't tilted on its journey going around the sun, if it was just standing straight up and down and just going around the sun like so, we wouldn't have the seasons as we know them. It would be uniformly hot at the equator and it would be uniformly cold at the poles. And nothing much would shift or change. We wouldn't have the volatility of the weather that we have. We wouldn't have tulips flowering at the right time of year. We wouldn't have the stingrays being fat. In fact, I think life on Earth might be just a little bit boring. my life so far as a stargazer. From that very first moment when I sat on a riverbank fishing with my dad, I've spent my life tuning into the big journeys our planet makes. But there's another epic journey going on while all this is happening, where our entire solar system is hurtling through space on this amazing journey going around the centre of our own galaxy. And while this journey began before humans walked the Earth, it's one you can still see in the night sky. These solar systems, these stars that are in the sky, they're all gathered in this enormous big 
arrangement in this big gathering that we call the Milky Way. We live out on the edge of the galaxy, and the Milky Way galaxy is a collection of something like 200,000 million solar systems, 200,000 million suns, 200,000 million stars. And we live on a planet that goes around one of those 200,000 million suns. How do you feel about that? The numbers are daunting. But we can detect this movement of our solar system through space as it takes us around the heart of our own galaxy. So here we are on, on top of these rich red cliffs of Walmadan, James Price Point. And looking out here in our Milky Way it has showed up for us beautifully. We can see the central bulge of the Milky Way there. And we're taking a journey around the centre of this galaxy. We're starting from a place over here just behind me towards a star called Vega. And we're going to come up and around the centre of this galaxy, and this is our entire solar system I'm talking about, and then come all the way back to here in about 210 million years. Now, the fascinating thing about that too, from this location that we're on, 130 million years ago, there were dinosaurs walking around on this beach just down here. There are 21 different species of dinosaur tracks in this country. So we were on the other side of that central bulge in the galaxy when that was going on. And I wonder crazy things like, when we get back around to the other side of the galaxy, are we going to have dinosaurs again? One of the problems we have is that we can't see our whole galaxy because we live inside of it. To gain a better understanding, we need to look elsewhere. We gain insights about our galaxy by looking at other galaxies, by looking at the spiral structure in other galaxies. Some of them we see them edge on, some of them we see them face on. This disk of our galaxy that we're getting acquainted with here tonight is about 100,000 light years from one side to the other. That disk also is only about 2,000 light years thick, so it's actually really skinny. If it was a pizza, it would be a thin crust pizza. So this is our galaxy and, and we're inside of it. But there are other galaxies out there that we can see too. We've got two of them out here tonight, which are called the large and the small clouds of Magellan. We've got one out the back here, which is the Andromeda Galaxy, the mighty Andromeda Galaxy. We can see these galaxies with our naked eye. When we start using babies like this, this five-inch refracting telescope, we can pull in more distant galaxies as well. But I've got another telescope that I want to introduce you to that's going to take us even further. In fact, it's the best eyes that humanity has. It's called Hubble. It's a school bus sized telescope that's in space. And the Hubble Space Telescope orbits the Earth at about four or five hundred kilometres up. And at that place, there's no atmosphere. So the views it has are incredibly sharp and clear. The director of the Hubble Space Telescope, he decided to find the blankest piece of sky he could find and take a picture of that. Now, the size of the patch of sky that he picked on was the size of a grain of rice held end on at arm's length. So it was the tiniest piece of sky. And when that photo came back, it's called the Hubble Deep Field. There were nearly 3,000 galaxies. Almost every point in this photo is a galaxy. A few years later, they put a new camera on the Hubble Space Telescope and they repeated that Hubble Deep Field to take the Hubble Deep Field too. And with better quality in the camera, they got over 10,000 galaxies. Again, 
almost every point in this photo is a galaxy. This is just incredible. Imagine that if we took a photo in every single part of the sky, in every single end on grain of rice, how many galaxies there actually are out there. And if you think about that just for even a minute or two, it'll just blow your mind. My own stargazing journey began when I tuned into the cycles of the moon and the turning of the Earth. And like our solar system, I've come a long way since then. I've shared this voyage with fellow stargazers from all over the planet, whether it's amongst a few or even a few thousand. Experiencing this journey, it's, you know, it's just something that is just treasure, absolute treasure.